Hi, my name is Monica McGrath. This is my 13th year of the 16th year here. Um, good to see familiar faces out there. It's very nice when you get an opportunity to introduce a colleague uh, and friend. Uh, my job this morning is, or this afternoon, is to introduce Adam Grant. I want to highlight a few things uh, about Adam for you um, to add to his resume. Um, first of all, he's, um, he's been named one of the 40 top business professors under 40, and that qualifies him as cool. <laughs> they don't have a 65 under. <laughs> but anyway, um, he is an exceptional scholar, and um, his, his research has made a significant e impact on the field of organizational behavior and organizational psychology. Many, many uh, impressive articles. Uh, you can see on the website. Um, he's an excellent consultant. He has a unique ability, and I've seen him do this, to translate theory into practical, implementable solutions that we in the field of practice tend to be able to use. Um, and he's an electric uh, person in the classroom, great educator. Uh, he's deeply committed to the learner. And he paves the way for them to go, I think, beyond the obvious platitudes and uh, explore the complexities of their leadership roles. So uh, because of that, he's been given the distinct honor of being the single highest rated professor in the Wharton MBA program, a source of both envy and um, motivation. Uh, anyway, uh, my pleasure to introduce Adam Grant. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, well, thank you for that. I actually stopped listening after Monica called me cool, um, which uh, my wife will be the first to tell you that's the first time I've ever been described that way. Um, so it's, it's a real honor to have the chance to address such a distinguished group. Um, there's a little bit of an irony to what I want to talk about today, because I have to talk about being quiet. And I'm not quite sure how to do that, but hopefully we're going to see how this works. The place I want to begin, just to, to dive in, is a call center that I entered about 10 years ago. This was a call center where people were doing a job that was described as worse than telemarketing. It was university fundraisers who are trying to convince all of you to donate your hard-earned money to your alma mater. And I got a call from the manager of this call center who said, let me just be honest with you. We've hired and fired three, academ or, sorry, three consultants and we thought, before we give up on this entirely, we might as well try an academic. And I figured, actually, this was a great place to begin, because at minimum, I could do no harm. And so what I did was I went into the call center, and I was trying to figure out why did they need me? Why were things going so badly? The first thing I discovered was a turnover rate exceeding 400% annually. So for those of you who think you have turnover problems, imagine your entire staff of 120 people quitting every two months and having to rehire, re-recruit, retrain, and re-motivate that staff six times a year. That's what they were facing. And when I started to analyze the job, this was not at all surprising. The callers only have one task, no variety. They have to pick up the phone and basically harass a bunch of alums to try to get them to give. Um, they don't have very much autonomy. They're given a standardized script because, of course, the idea is to boil down into the fewest number of words possible. This script to, I can get you, I can get you to try to give, and then I can move on to call a couple of million other alums every year. Now, the worst part of this job, though, by far, is the rejection. Average rejection rates in this call center are over 99%. So if you are lucky, one sucker out of every 100 will actually give. So the callers are completely burned out and demotivated. And you know, again, this is a really exciting place for me to enter as an organizational psychologist, because I know that no matter what I do, I cannot make motivation any worse. <laughs> so I walk in. And I'm trying to figure out, what do we do? Do we give them more autonomy in their scripts? Do we, perhaps, try to give them a little bit more variety in their tasks and let them do things other than calls on the phone? Do we, perhaps, even give them incentive compensation, um, which turned out to be illegal, largely because there was a group of callers who had decided it would be really fun to write down fake pledges and say, yes, these alums gave $10,000 each today. And then by the time, of course, the cheating was discovered, they would have been laughing all the way to the bank. So there's no incentive compensation as an option. And I'm trying to figure out, what else can you do to motivate these fundraising callers? Forget about the turnover and retention issue. I just want to convince them to stay on the phones and keep raising money for this university. So I walk into the call center. And 
I was interviewing the callers and doing some observations. And what really struck me more than anything was a sign that one of the callers had posted in front of his desk. Um, really one of the most uplifting, motivating, and inspiring signs I've ever come across. Um, not generally a fan of motivational posters, but this one took the cake. And I've actually, I took a picture of it right there because I was so impressed by it. Um, I've saved it for the past decade and I wanted to bring it here to all of you. Here is the sign in its full glory. <laughs> that was a life-changing moment for me. <laughs> to this day, you will never catch me in a suit that is not dark. <laughs> um, but, but this is also a really poignant observation. Because I thought, look, the problem that these callers are facing more than anything else is they don't feel appreciated and valued. They feel like they're raising money for this university, but nobody cares. And so I thought what we really need to do is help the callers understand how their jobs make a difference. So I started asking some questions. Where does the money they raise actually go? And who benefits from it? And I got a lot of very obtuse answers that didn't give me what I was looking for. But eventually, I was able to break down. There's support for new buildings. There's athletic teams. There's student scholarships. And I thought, OK, the student scholarships are really where the motivation is at. What we need to do, of course, is help these callers how the money they raise is actually enabling other people to go to school and afford an education. So the managers pull together a bunch of information. Um, they share some statistics with the callers. And they say, look, here's how much money you guys have actually raised for scholarship students. And here are all the people that you're helping go to school. It's an incredibly noble purpose. And I'm just there basically observing, trying to figure out if it works. So my job is basically to run this as a little experiment, where some of the callers get exposed to that speech from the managers, and others don't. And I've got a really nice sort of treatment and control group. And then I have data on how hard the callers are working, things like time on the phone, number of calls made, and also their productivity. How much revenue do they actually bring in for the call center? I look at the data, and the callers who actually got to hear from their managers went down in every metric imaginable. They made fewer calls, they spent less time on the phone, and they raised less money. Now, this was sort of a sad statement about the ability of these managers to deliver a motivational speech, we discovered. But it was also, I think, a really compelling statement about a challenge that leaders face. I thought that maybe this is the right message, but it's coming from the wrong source. And what if there's another group of people that could actually inspire more effectively than the leaders in this call center? So the natural source, of course, was the scholarship students. So I go around, and I try to find some scholarship recipients who are willing to tell their stories. I've got this big intervention plan. There are going to be a dozen scholarship students, different walks of life from different areas of the world, and studying different topics. who are going to tell the callers, here's how your work changed my life and enabled me to go to school here. Managers, of course, say this is way too inefficient. We can't waste this much time. I will give you five minutes, and you can do whatever you want in those five minutes to try to connect the callers to their impact on scholarship students. So I'm pretty discouraged by that. What I do is I look for the most charismatic scholarship student I can find. Um, and I found him. One of these studies was at the University of Michigan. And this student's name was Will. Will had just been voted most likely to become president of the United States by his graduating class. Um, he is an incredibly dynamic speaker, and I thought, this is the guy in five minutes that's going to inspire the callers. So Will walks in for a meeting. There's a randomly assigned group of callers who are going to hear the story from him, and he starts to talk a little bit. And he says, look, I grew up in Massachusetts. I always wanted to be a Michigan Wolverine. The Wolverines are in my blood, and I mean that quite literally. Because apparently, my parents recently told me that my brother was conceived after a Michigan football victory. <laughs> Um, so he talks about how he, he really dreamed of becoming a Wolverine. His parents couldn't afford the out-of-state tuition. And because of the, the need-based scholarship he was able to receive, funded by the work that the callers did, he was able to come to school, and it really had changed his life. Five minutes, you hear from Will, you go back to work. Now, again, I'm pretty pessimistic about whether this is going to have any impact. But I have the data available, so I start to track the effects. And I'm really stunned by the results that I see, which is the average caller who heard from Will showed nearly triple the number of minutes they spent on the phone a full month later, week by week, to where they had started. So they're working a lot harder now. The control group that didn't meet well shows no change in their effort. They're also making more calls. They're doubling in the number of calls they make per hour. And on average, they showed about 170% caller by caller increase in revenue raised. Five minutes, one scholarship student. 
So then I started thinking, OK, this is a will effect. If you are the charismatic next president of the United States, you too could inspire that kind of effort. But what about a regular scholarship student from a fairly ordinary walk of life? So I found her. Her name is Emily. Emily is a freshman who's so shy and so quiet that you can barely hear her when she speaks. And I figure this is the opposite end of the spectrum from, from Will. Emily walks in. I'm observing again to see what happens. She comes in like this, and she says, hi. My name is Emily. I g g got this scholarship, and I wanted it. And she could barely get through her words. Um, I had to strain to hear her, and I was sitting right behind her. And I was just sure that this experience was not going to work. When I looked at the data, Emily's effect was two and a half times stronger than Will's. Two and a half times. The average caller who met Emily for five minutes showed a 400% week by week increase in money raised going from $400 a week to over $2,000 a week. And that lasted for a full month after meeting Emily. Now, I was really struck by that. And it turns out that it's a lot easier to empathize with Emily than it is with Will. Um, one thing is, you can see that you know, she actually has a real need. Um, the second thing is, a lot of people feel like if she didn't get this scholarship, she's just going nowhere in life. <laughs> um, <laughs> whereas Will is fine either way, right? So uh, there's an empathy piece. But there's also the element of authenticity. Will comes in, he sounds slick and smooth and polished. Whereas Emily, you know she's speaking from the heart. And in fact, no person in their right mind would intentionally come in and deliver that speech um, unless they felt they had no other choice. So I got really interested in this idea. Because if you think about what was going on here, this is a five minute intervention that led to a 400% increase in caller by caller productivity for a full month. What's most powerful about it is if you take 23 callers who met Emily, they raised over 36,000 extra dollars every week just from interacting with her. And what's striking to me about this is that they never once had to hear from a leader. And this has really led me to rethink the role of leadership a little bit. And I got to wondering, OK, why don't more leaders do this? Why do most leaders feel that they have to be the ones delivering inspiring messages? Why don't they think about other sources of those messages? Because um, in some ways, I think this idea of bringing in these scholarship students, if you were running this call center, is common sense. Of course, you want the people who work for you to see the people they're helping. And yet, it's not common practice. Last year, I pulled over 1,000 executives, very, very diverse uh, walks of life, from military generals to Fortune 500 CEOs and just about everything in between. Fewer than 1% of them actually recommended this as a solution to the call center problem. Very, very few of them thought of bringing in the scholarship student. And I want to know why not. To answer that question, why is this common sense but not common practice, I want to give you all a chance to do a self-assessment. Um, this is the moment when I need to clarify, by the way, I'm an organizational psychologist, not a clinical psychologist. So those of you who have existential crises after taking this test, don't come to me. Uh, here it is. Just take a moment. You can rate yourself on these items. Use a 0 to 10 scale. Where 0 is, I am never this way, 10 is, I am always this way, and 5 would be somewhere in between. For those of you who are very detail-oriented, you may use any numbers between 0 and 10. As of 2012, Wharton undergraduates no longer recognize that theme song. <laughs> um, when you're done, what I'd like you to do is add up your scores. And math is not always the strong suit of we psychologists, but you should have a score somewhere between 0 and 100. <laughs> Thank you for the courtesy laughs. Um, when you're done, if you could look up at me, I will know you're done. And I want to try to make a little bit of sense out of this scale. Those of you who are looking at your neighbor's scores right now, uh, to quote the psychologist Brian Little, it's really lame to cheat on a personality test. <laughs> um, but I will say, the higher your score on this test, the greater your likelihood of trying to copy your neighbor. <laughs> so <laughs> what you've all just taken is an assessment of extroversion, introversion. Many of you are familiar with it from the Myers-Briggs. It turned out that Carl Jung only got extroversion, introversion about 50% right. And I want to try to get to the heart of what does it really fundamentally mean to be an extrovert versus an introvert. But first, let's find out where all of you stand. 
So technically, if you scored above 55 on this scale and you are honest and self-aware, I would call you an extrovert. How many of you scored above 55? OK, we have a lot of extroverts in the room. Good to know. Anybody score in the 45 to 55 range? OK, those of you who with your hands up, I'm going to call you an ambivert in a moment. <laughs> Don't ask me what that means, but it's a really cool term, right? <laughs> um, and then anybody below 45? OK, we have a few people who claim themselves to be introverts. Um, if you are, I don't know what you're doing at a leadership conference. But uh, <laughs> we're going to get back to that. Stay tuned. So let me show you some data. Um, before we get to the data, though, let me just say a word about the way I think about introversion and extroversion. Ashton and Lee are two psychologists who have spent their whole careers trying to figure out what does it fundamentally mean to be an introvert versus an extrovert. And they find out it's sort of related, like the Myers-Briggs told many of you, to where you get your energy. But it's more related to how your, your neocortex in your brain processes stimulation. So somewhere up here, you have a neocortex. It's sort of the opposite of the lizard brain, for those of you that are, that are not big neuroscience fans. It's the part of the brain that processes stimulation, helps govern willpower and self-control. And if you think about the neocortex, basically what the neocortex is trying to do, and in fact, you've been doing this your entire lives, whether you know it or not, is to get to this point that we call optimal arousal. It's the point in your neocortex where you're fully engaged. If you're an athlete, you'd say, I'm in the zone, I'm focused, I'm on. It's a point where we all feel sort of very effective and happy. Um, if you get ab above that point, you'd be at the point of overload, where you have too much stimulation, too much information coming at you. If you're below that point, you'd be at the point of, of basically boredom, where you're understimulated. So everybody wants to be in the optimal zone of arousal. Um, and it's generally a place where we tend to be, again, happy and effective. The challenge is introverts and extroverts have opposite ways of getting there. So if you look at uh, some classic research by Hans Isaac and his colleagues, what they show is that for those of you who are extroverts, anybody score in the 90s, by the way, on this scale? OK, a few of you. Um, you're, you actually start out neocortically with inadequate arousal. So you start out way down here. And one of the ways that you get to the optimal level is you seek out stimulation. Um, generally speaking, that means being the center of attention. Because it turns out that social attention is just about the most stimulating thing neocortically that can happen in life, more so than skydiving or going to a rock concert. So one of the reasons you seek out attention from other people is it actually raises your arousal and helps you get engaged. On the other hand, those of you who are extreme introverts, anybody in the 10s or 20s? Yeah, you wouldn't have even set foot in this room um, if you were. Uh, but if you were, you'd start out way up here over the level of optimal arousal. And so to get to that same point of engagement, you'd actually be trying to reduce stimulation and sort of fade more into the background. And that's kind of how we think about the neocortexes of introverts and extroverts differently. The ambiverts are the lucky people who actually start out in the exact right place. And so your default when you wake up in the morning is engaged, which gives you a little bit more flexibility to be comfortable acting more introverted and more extroverted without getting burned out or bored. So now you know way more about the neuropsychology of introversion and extroversion than you ever wanted to know. I promise there will be no more of that. But I think this is really useful to know. Because if you think about introverts and extroverts as basically differing in how much they like social attention, then you can start to make sense of a trend that I want to show you. So in the United States, according to some research by Denise Owens and Stephen Dilchert that was done in 2009, this is the US population. If you're just going to cut it right at the middle, exactly 50% of people score on the introverted side of the spectrum, exactly 50% score on the extroverted side of the spectrum. Now, this is actually a really crude analysis in some ways, because if you really look at the data, Introversion and extroversion is distributed like a bell curve. It's a normal distribution. And most people fall somewhere in the middle, either ambiverted or only slightly introverted or slightly extroverted. It's more and more rare to go out to either extreme. But if we were to just cut it right at the midpoint, we'd say half of all Americans are extroverts. My question for you is, what percent of all American leaders are extroverts above the midpoint? And you can shout out your answers, preferably now. 90. That's a pretty high estimate. 70? 50. Who said eight? That's oddly specific. Um, <laughs> so here are the data. This is a, a nationally representative sample. What you get is this picture. 96% of American leaders score on the extroverted side of the spectrum. Only 4% below the midpoint. Now this, to me, is part of why nobody thinks, when I pull corporate executives and military generals, why nobody thinks to say, let's bring in the scholarship student. If most leaders are extroverts, they feel they need to be the center of attention. They need to be the ones delivering inspiring messages. Now, for those of you who want to look at how this breaks down in a little bit more depth, 
Here's a breakdown of scoring in the top 25% of extroversion, so being very extroverted, not just above the mean. And what you see is the population, of course, only 25% of people can do that. Supervisors, half of them are there. By the time you get to a top level executive, 80% of people are very, very extroverted. So every level you climb up the hierarchy, you get more and more extroverts being attracted to that role and being selected into those leadership positions. And my question is, what are the consequences of that? Is it good to be an extroverted leader? Um, let me just say, to be clear, you, many of you claim to be extroverts, um, and you're going to feel really good about the data I'm about to show you. So there are some neuroscientists who believe that leadership is so intertwined with extroversion that one of the ways to define an extrovert is to enjoy being a leader, because that's fundamentally being in the center of attention. And if you look at the data on this, they're pretty consistent with that idea. Um, one study that I did with colleagues Francesca Gino and Dave Hoffman was in pizza stores, which was sort of a fun setting to study this. Um, we got data from pizza stores around the United States, and we got basically the, the leader of each store to fill out a survey, just like you all just did, of how introverted versus extroverted they are. Then we got seven weeks of store profit data, and we were able to find out, are you actually more profitable if you're an extroverted leader of a pizza store than an introverted leader? And again, extroverts, you'll be very pleased, yes. On average, extroverted leaders had stores that brought in 16% higher profits, especially after you adjust for all the other factors that might affect profit, like what city you're in, um, and so on. But here's the interesting twist. If you look at that effect, it's only for stores where there's a certain type of employee that I'm going to call a good follower, an employee basically who's looking for direction from above, who's dutiful, who's going to listen really well to you. Turns out extroverts are great at engaging and motivating and inspiring those good followers. Right? They're enthusiastic, they're charismatic, they're outgoing, and they really encourage people to want to complete high quality and high quantity work. But what about another type of employee that we need in this economy more than ever before? The opposite, I think, of being a good follower is basically an employee who takes the initiative to lead, only not from a formal leadership role. I'm going to call that a proactive employee. It's somebody who brings in ideas and suggestions and perhaps has a better set of work processes and methods. They might challenge the status quo, but they might also cause some kind of improvement in organizational functioning. Now, it turns out the more dynamic, the more unpredictable, the more uncertain the economy gets to connect to the last talk, the more we need proactive people in our organizations. We know it's impossible for leaders in a really turbulent environment to anticipate all of the changes that they might need to make to recognize all of the problems that might be going on below them. And that's where we really need the proactive employees to drive change from below. So if we need these proactive people, who leads them more effectively? Is it the introverts or the extroverts? Introverts, yes, it would be the opposite of the extroverts. <laughs> um, but in a really interesting way and in a more compelling way than I would have thought. So if you look at these pizza stores that have really proactive employees who are constantly coming up with better delivery methods, with better ways to cook pizza efficiently so that you can get a lot of them out during the Super Bowl, for example, when you have a bunch of proactive employees in your pizza store, introverted leaders actually get 14% higher profits than extroverted leaders. Um, <laughs> this is not to say, of course, that all introverts lead proactive employees well. But what the evidence shows pretty clearly is there's something going on where extroverted leaders are ineffective with this group of self-starting, motivated employees. And I got to really wondering why. So you got this 14% lower profits for these extroverted leaders. Follow-up studies that Francesca, Dave, and I ran showed that when you have an extroverted leader and people come from below with ideas and suggestions, extroverted leaders are threatened on average. They like to be the center of attention. They don't like proactive employees stealing the spotlight. And as a result, they tend to react in a slightly more defensive way, which is interesting because if you get good followers, they actually perceive their extroverted leaders as more positive. But proactive employees feel like their extroverted leaders are actually resisting their suggestions and their ideas, which has really two costs. One is it discourages them from contributing because they don't feel like their ideas and their perspectives are valued. And two, maybe even more worrisome, it actually discourages them from benefiting from the ideas that come from below. So in a follow-up study, we had proactive people just come to leaders with suggestions. And the leaders were instructed to act in either an extroverted or an introverted manner. And it turned out 
those proactive people produced 28% lower output when they brought their suggestions to an extroverted leader than when they brought them to an introverted leader. So I think that there's a real power struggle that often goes on between extroverted leaders and very, very proactive employees who love to take initiative. And maybe there are actually some benefits to leading in a more introverted and quiet way. And that's what I want to try to think about in the next few minutes. So let me just uh, make my confession now. I am an introvert. For those of you who do not believe me, um, I can just give you a few facts to back it up. The first one is that I went to a rock concert once, and I couldn't think for a week. Um, and I should qualify that. It wasn't a rock concert. It was a bare naked ladies concert. Um, and that was completely overstimulating. Second data point, when I started teaching nearly a decade ago, the most frequent comment from my students, after you remind us of a Muppet, um, you may know more about what that means than I do, but they told me it was the Swedish chef. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so the next most frequent comment was that I was so nervous standing in front of my students that I was causing them to physically shake in their seats. Um, as an introvert, I've often found it challenging to be in roles that require me to act in a more extroverted manner. Um, right this very moment, I feel like I have to act a little bit more extroverted than I might naturally. Um, on one hand, you would all be really bored if you saw my normal introverted style and you had to listen to that for a few minutes. Um, but also, I would be really bored because uh, it's not engaging at all. But um, I think that sometimes we get trapped into these roles more than we think we need to be. And I want to illustrate this with an experience I had when I was in a leadership role. Has anybody traveled with the Let's Go books by any chance? So 10 years ago, before I ran the company into the ground, all of your hands would have been up. Um, no longer. What we have now, basically, is you're familiar with a Lonely Planet, a Fodors, a Fromers, a Rough Guides, or a Rick Steves. 10 years ago, we were a competitor of theirs. And I had the misfortune of managing um, a team at Let's Go that was responsible for advertising sales after September 11th. The travel economy had just crashed. It was the year after the internet bubble had collapsed. And so I had to try to motivate these people who were calling clients where half of them went out of business. And the other half said, we're in a really challenging economic circumstance. The first thing we've cut is our advertising budget. So hotel operators, airlines, tour guides, they all said, sorry, we can't afford to advertise. My job was to try to get my employees motivated to keep making cold calls. And this is part of what I enjoyed so much about interacting with the fundraisers, is it reminded me of the, the work that I used to do. But I came in, and I felt like I just had to be an extroverted leader all the time. So I'd come in in the morning. I'd give a really big motivational pep talk. I'd try to engage them and give them lots of feedback. And I started to burn out really fast. Um, I started to get exhausted. One of the things we know is that introverts who operate in roles that require them to be extroverted all the time are at major risk for burnout and even ill health. And I was definitely starting to experience a lot of that. So I also found, though, that I was just a terrible motivational speaker, and that my employees weren't actually motivated by anything that I was saying. <laughs> so I, I got to thinking, what else could I do to motivate this team to keep calling prospects? And one morning, I decided to try something radical. I came into the office on a Monday, and my employees could tell I was just exhausted and really frustrated with the fact that we were falling far below our budget um, we were not going to actually be able to make anywhere near what our goals were. And I said, guys, I, just, I need to be really honest with you. I'm having a hard time in this job, and I'm going to quit. My employees were all pretty surprised, and I waited for a moment to try to get a little bit of, of sort of timing. And then I said, I'm going to quit because I want to do your job for a week. And I want to find out how hard is it to actually recruit business in this economy. So I literally stopped managing for a week. And my job was to find prospects, to call them, to sell them on advertising their services in the Let's Go books. Now, this was like my sort of foray into the undercover boss world. <laughs> and a couple of things that you've all seen on TV happened there. One is um, there was a huge amount of vulnerability that I had to express by doing that. Because my employees saw what a bad salesman I was. Um, they actually had a whole series of jokes making fun of my sales technique. Um, that they had mastered and would sort of regale me with as we were starting work each morning, which was fun. Um, but the other thing that happened was I got a chance to actually get a taste of their work. And I got to thinking that we were actually missing part of our market, and that maybe there were some clients that we hadn't considered. Maybe we needed to leave the travel market because the travel market was in trouble. And we needed to think about our target demographic, which was college students who read these books trying to travel on a budget. 
So I started contacting really diverse clients who had nothing to do with travel but really wanted to reach college students. And they started to respond. And I started to get some people to, to buy. And soon, after my week of basically quitting my manager job, I raised about $40,000 in revenue, which wasn't a lot, but it was more than my employees said they could do in a given week. They had watched it. They knew that it wasn't because of my technique. In fact, they knew that my technique was so inferior that they could do much better. Um, and after that, their motivation completely transformed. They were coming in early. They were generating new ideas for prospects. They hit over three dozen industries that we had never contacted before that ended up advertising. Um, we ended up clearing our budget, and I won this Manager of the Year award that was completely driven by me saying nothing and literally just doing the employee's job as opposed to my manager job. And this was a really eye-opening experience for me. Um, a Wharton professor here, Sagal Barsaid, calls this leading by doing. And I think it's another way of leading quietly. It's a way, basically, of saying, look, yeah, I could lead through my words, and I could develop really compelling and charismatic rhetoric, or I could actually lead first through my actions. And I found that my words took on way more meaning, the few that I used, after I had gone and done the employee's job. Um, it created a sense of what Tomini Simons at Cornell has called behavioral integrity, which is basically a consistency between your words and your deeds. And I had that once I had actually done their job. I didn't have it before. And it was really interesting for me because it stimulated some reflection about, did I really need to act like an extrovert in order to be an effective leader? There's some great work by the psychologist Brian Little, uh, one of my heroes and mentors, who has been studying introversion extroversion for years. And what he finds is that it's actually quite comfortable for an introvert to act like an extrovert, as long as you get what's, what's called a restorative niche, which is basically sort of a place where you can retreat to be your more introverted self. For me, that's reading, writing, or for those of you who have emailed with me way too much, responding to emails. And I find that it's much easier to maintain my energy if I have to play the center of attention kind of role in speaking or in leading when I have those kinds of outlets built into my day on a regular basis, because they reduce that level of stimulation from overload back to optimal. Um, there's a phenomenal book about this idea called Quiet by Susan Cain. I know some of you have read it. Um, for those of you who are extremely extroverted and won't sit down to read the book, she has an 18-minute TED Talk <laughs> that I highly recommend. Um, only if you're really extroverted, you may be bothered by the fact that there's no dialogue with her when she's on the screen. But um, I think that this is a real opportunity to think about developing what Brian Little calls a second nature. Um, I think of your personality, that scale you just filled out. Are you an extrovert, introvert, or ambivert? That's your first nature. There's a big biological and genetic basis of it. It's hard to change. But what we know is all of us develop a second nature, a comfortable role that we walk into, the role that I'm playing right now. And that turns out to be a role that in some ways is very much out of character, because I am an introvert acting like an extrovert. But in other ways, as Brian would say, I'm doing it because of my character. I really love these ideas. I believe in sharing this knowledge. And as a result, I'm, yeah, stepping out of my personality-based character, but I'm doing it in service of a set of values that I really believe in deeply. And I think this is something that we need probably more thought about in our workplaces. We need room for introverted leaders to act like extroverts, but be able to actually take a step back. We also need room for the reverse to happen, for extroverted leaders to know, especially when they're with proactive employees, how to actually dial down that style and create space for those employees to demand the center of attention. So in terms of a possible call to action, I want to get you thinking about a couple things that you might be able to do to lead more quietly. So I think for those of you who like the idea of leading by doing, I think there's real power in saying, look, I don't just have to influence people through my words. There's a chance to show it may not be a huge amount of time. Seagal recommends something like 10% of your time actually doing the work that your employees do, both for the learning and the trust and rapport that develop through that. I think it's a great way to lead quietly. It doesn't require speeches. It doesn't require words. It really requires putting your money where your mouth is in terms of actually getting into the nitty gritty of the work that people below you and around you do. A second thing you could think about doing is outsourcing inspiration. This is what happened in the call center that I was working with. And it turns out there's some really innovative companies that are starting to think about, well, maybe, just maybe, it's not leaders who have to deliver every single message about why our work matters, who have to deliver every vision and mission statement. I'll throw out a couple examples. Medtronic, medical technology company. Some of you are familiar with their annual holiday party, where 30,000 plus employees all come together. And yes, their CEO speaks. 
But the moment everybody's waiting for is when six patients walk up on stage and tell their stories about how Medtronic's work has changed their lives. Bill George, the former CEO, told me a couple years ago that every single Medtronic employee has a defining moment where they come face to face with a patient whose life their work has changed or contributed to changing. That is not an effect a leader can create. A leader, in most cases, cannot share that kind of firsthand story about how this technology makes a difference in rehabilitating people from accidents. But the patients, they can tell that story in a really emotional and compelling and authentic way. John Deere has a nice example of this. If you were to ever build a tractor for John Deere, one of the things that you would get to do is you get to meet the farmer who ordered it. And oftentimes, it's a farmer coming in with their family. It's the first tractor they were able to, to afford. And if you worked on that tractor, you have a golden key that you get to hand over to that farmer and actually see the person who's going to benefit from your product use it for the first time. Again, a powerful way of letting, perhaps, the customers do the inspiring when you get to see these people you're creating products for. Some other examples that I like. A couple years ago, Facebook had a consumer marketing team that said, we want to learn a little bit more about how our services could be useful to the, uh, the billion or so Facebook users that exist in the world. And we're going to invite a bunch of users to focus groups and talk about what they like and what they don't like. And along the way, one of the marketing officers said, gee, we never thought about sharing these stories with our engineers and actually letting them know how the software they create is helping people fall in love and find long lost relatives and, and do some of the amazing things that Facebook does. So they decided they're actually going to bring in Facebook users on a regular basis to talk about how the company's technology is changing their lives. And again, really reinforce, not from the leader, but from this end user's perspective, how the work makes a difference. Volvo has a club. If you've ever been in a serious accident in a Volvo car, it's called the Volvo Save My Life Club. If a physician, nurse, emergency medical responder, police officer, or firefighter um, determines that a Volvo car made the difference between life and death for you, you're asked to record a story, audio or video. Those stories are available for all of Volvo employees to watch and listen to, and again, be reminded of how their work makes a difference in the lives of their customers. Wells Fargo is a really innovative vice president there by the name of Ben Sikorzy, who years ago wanted to really get people um, who are working for him at Wells Fargo, bankers mostly, to sell a new mortgage product. And they didn't really get why it was valuable. And he saw the product really making a difference in people's lives, allowing them to get out of debt or to buy their first home. So he started creating little wow videos. And he basically got these customers together to talk about how the loans from Wells Fargo were really influencing their lives. Lo and behold, there's a huge boost in his employees' motivation to sell the product and their results. And I think it's a really nice example, again, of bringing that end user face to face, no words from Ben required. One other example I want to throw out from the medical world. There's a, a study that was done a couple of years ago by Israeli radiologists led by Yonatan Turner, which gave radiologists an x-ray to scan. And their job is basically to look at the x-ray and try to find uh, what are called incidental findings. So you have a primary purpose for the x-ray, then you have a bunch of other things that might show up. And you might think of those as health risks. Can you detect them all, even though you're not looking for them? What Turner and his colleagues found is that all these radiologists are given the same exact x-ray today and three months later, and about half of them got more accurate and half of them got less accurate. It's the same x-ray. How could some people get better and some people get worse? Well, it turned out that in the study, half of the people were given a photo of the patient whose x-ray it was, which radiologists often don't see. And they get to actually see the photo of the patient whose x-ray they're going to be diagnosing. They start to empathize with the patient, think about that person as a human being, maybe even, what if this were my family member? They write 12% longer reports. Their diagnostic accuracy goes up by 46% from one photo. If you take that photo away, it drops by 46%. And it turns out that whether you had the photo first or second determines whether you got better or worse. And the photo of the patient was enough to motivate you to develop a more accurate and more careful diagnosis. So again, these are all different ways of outsourcing inspiration, really bringing the end user, the client or the customer, face to face with employees, instead of letting the leader do all the talking. My third recommendation, and this is the, the final of the three recommendations, is to think about the other 80-20 rule. Jim Quigley introduced me to this. Uh, he's the former CEO and partner at Deloitte. And what he actually does to make sure that he leads quietly is in every meeting he walks into where he has a leadership role, he will not talk any more than 20% of the time. 
And his comment is, I don't learn anything when I'm talking. I learn when I'm listening. And he finds that to be a really helpful practice for making sure that he actually gets ideas and helps his employees feel valued. Now, I should say, there's a phenomenal book that Keith Mernon just published called Do Nothing. And it is tempting for those of you who like the idea of quiet leadership to assume that you will have no contribution whatsoever if you embrace this style. I'm going to perhaps not talk as much. I'm going to let other people deliver my motivational messages. I'm going to spend a lot more time listening. Um, but I think there's some really powerful social capital that gets created when you actually embrace this quiet, leader, quiet leadership style. And there's a really powerful study that James Pennebaker did at Texas a couple years ago that I want to close with before we open it up for questions. First of all, take this test, please. I'm not going to say that extroverts are always narcissists, but the correlation range is positive. Um, Pennebaker, years ago, brought strangers together. And he wanted them to have sort of a get to know you conversation like you might have in the hallway in about 20 minutes with someone you've never met. And he got them all together. You could talk about anything you wanted if you're in this group. You could talk about the weather. You could talk about your favorite sports team. You could talk about a problem you might be facing in your organization. And then he asked you afterward, how much did you enjoy the conversation, and how much do you want to talk to these people again? And he's got a measure of how much you talked. And it turned out, the more you talked, the more you liked the group. And he calls this the joy of talking. But it goes further. You don't just like the group more if you talk more. You actually say you learned more about the other people in the group the more you talked. <laughs> I kid you not. Pennebaker's words. People, and I would add especially extroverts, find listening to themselves talk to be an incredibly enjoyable learning experience. <laughs> if that's not a case for leading quietly, I don't know what is. Thank you. Um, happy to take a few questions if we have time, or comments for that matter. Yes? So what do you do if you're an innovative employee with an extroverted boss? Do you need to just go find another job? <laughs> <laughs> I might start, Katie, by changing your boss's personality. No. Um, I think that, that oftentimes what we see is there, there are settings in which people sort of gravitate from introverted to extroverted roles and vice versa. So I would ask, what are the times that you could catch your boss in a more introverted frame of mind? It's typically not in a big meeting where he or she is supposed to be the center of attention. Right? Often it's a one-on-one -on -one or a side conversation where there's much more of an opportunity for a back and forth dialogue. In some cases, if your boss is a careful reader, it's an email exchange or you know, a, a phone call. But I would think a little bit about the medium and the setting for the conversation. Because we all, you can all think of times when you acted like an introvert and acted like an extrovert. And I want to catch my boss in the moment when he or she is the most receptive, I guess would be my quick thoughts. Yes? Yeah, a little bit. So the, the research on, on generational differences, I think, is really tricky. Um, one of the problems that shows up is most studies will start by saying, let's survey you know, a bunch of people of different generations, and then see, for example, do they score differently on introversion, extroversion? Or do they have different styles of working? And when you get differences, the question I always want to ask is, are those differences driven by generation? Or is it just age and wisdom? And is it possible that you know, everyone would have been sort of similar if they had been caught at the same age? There's a psychologist at San Diego State, Jean Twenge, uh, who has uh, two really fun books on this topic. One is called Generation Me, and the other is called The Narcissist Epidemic. And what she does is she overcomes this problem by getting surveys that were done of each generation when they're the exact same age and stage of life. So one of her studies, for example, looks at high school students who are 18 years old, um, who were surveyed in 1960. Then you've got another group of high school students in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, et cetera. So every time you have different generations of people at high school age. And that's a fairer test, I think, of whether there are generational differences. She does find some differences. She finds, for example, that millennials care slightly less about intrinsic rewards, about, for example, enjoyable work, as opposed to sort of climbing the career ladder. She finds that they tend to care more about self-expression and less about social approval. 
uh, which may explain some of the patterns that many of you see with your kids. Um, what's interesting about her research, though, is that the effects are tiny. And age differences are swamped, or sorry, generational differences are swamped by age. And so what you get are basically, most generations are pretty similar if you got them at the same age. And most studies that return differences are much more about youth and inexperience than they are actually about generation. Um, but those two books are much better resources than I could be. Yes? If you put the work in an international context, different cultures may play this out very differently. What do you know about that? Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating set of questions and hard to study across cultures given that we have very different norms in different settings. Um, one of the most consistent findings in, in psychological research, Costa and McRae have shown over and over again that you get basically um, higher introversion scores in East Asian cultures than in Western cultures, which is familiar to a lot of people in the audience. Now, the interesting question is, is that actually a difference in personality? I don't think so. Um, I believe it's a difference in social norms and basically uh, appropriate mechanisms of expression. Here's the interesting thing about East Asian versus um, Western cultures, though, that even in East Asian cultures where there's a much stronger introverted norm, it's still the relatively more extroverted people who get promoted into leadership roles. And so it's not that we actually prefer introverts in that context, it's that we prefer our extroverts a little bit less extroverted. Um, and I think that's one dynamic that I find really interesting. Um, I think the other dynamic that's playing out across cultures is very much a sort of a skip level dynamic that we see right now of, in some ways, there's a complementarity between the proactive employees and the introverted leaders. But then who do you put above the introverted leaders? And how do you make sure there are matches across different levels of the organization? I think it's a really vexing problem that's waiting to be studied. And I wish I had a better thought on that. Yes? Is there any relation between your work and the work that Margaret uh, Kelly's been on as it relates to not just extroverts? Tangentially, yes. So extroverts are slightly more likely to be optimists. Introverts are slightly more likely to be pessimists. But um, there are, I think, two major distinctions there. One is extroversion and introversion has a much greater um, biogenic source. So the neocortex plays a bigger role in that. Optimism is much more learned, typically, as is pessimism. The other big difference is you have to cross another personality trait along with introversion and extroversion um, to get better prediction of optimists and pessimists from their personalities, which would be what we think of as emotional stability. So are you cool, calm, and collected under pressure versus do you tend to react with anxiety and anger and frustration when you're stressed? And what we find basically is that a prototypical pessimist is typically um, much more on the emotional side of that and much more introverted, and that a prototypical optimist basically is much more emotionally stable and much more extroverted. Um, so that's one way to think about it anyway. Yes? Motivated by your Dilbert slide, is there any correlation, say, with the engineers and whether they are extroverted or introverted? <laughs> Yeah, so there, there are huge self-selection effects if you look at what careers people choose. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of evidence that introverts are much more drawn to engineering and technical roles. I think the interesting question, though, is who is promoted in those roles? Um, I've been doing some research at Google for the past few years, and one of the, the questions we're currently exploring is, is it still the extroverts, even in an engineering setting there, that get promoted, or does it actually reverse? And I think the jury is still out on that. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely does. And I think that as far as I've seen, the evidence is really conflicting on how social media is either facilitating versus inhibiting these kinds of conversations. There's a lot of research suggesting that introverts self-disclose more, for example, when they're in social media and when they're sort of dealing not face-to-face. -face. One of the reasons of being, of course, that, that eye contact with other people is one of the most stimulating things that people experience. And so introverts are often less overwhelmed if they can step back a little bit and communicate via chat or Twitter or text. The interesting thing, though, is that a lot of our social media are moving more social. And so it's much more about our networks and our relationships. And here, again, the introverts seem to be disadvantaged. Um, Keith Campbell and his colleagues have some evidence, for example, that extroverts have far more Facebook friends than introverts do. Um, and that the same kind of very broad networking that extroverts do in real life is mirrored in their social networks. And so I, still, I think we're still looking for ways of helping introverts sort of navigate some of the social challenges they might experience um, within the new developments in technology. And I'd be interested in anybody's thoughts on that who wants to chat afterward. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are times when you have to stand up and speak, right? And I'm not saying that leaders should not be vocal. Um, I'm saying that some of us feel more pressured to be vocal all the time than might be either healthy or effective. 
But I think that in crisis, certainly, that's where we most often need to hear directly from our leaders and want to. Um, one example that comes to mind for me is um, I was working a couple years ago with, uh, with a biotech joint venture. And uh, the CEO was extremely introverted and had never, ever spoken in front of a group of employees that was greater than six. And it was a pretty large joint venture. And so there were a lot of people who just felt like they didn't know what he wanted in terms of, uh, in terms of their future. They hit a crisis. And they were basically in jeopardy of being shut down by the parent companies. And uh, there were a series of consultants who were saying, you've got to speak. You've got to speak. They need to hear from you. You have to create the burning platform in the sense of urgency. And he wouldn't speak. And finally, I sat down with him. This was another one of those situations of we, the consultants didn't work. Let's try an academic. And I sat down with him and started asking him about what are his beliefs uh, about the leader's role. And when he started answering those questions, one of his answers was, I think it's my job to give vision and direction to the organization. And I said, well, how are you going to do that if, you know, if you're not actually speaking in front of people? So he decided to do it. His first ever speech, he got his 200 top people together. And he stood up and gave the most awful speech anybody in that organization had ever heard. Um, the joint venture got shut down about a month later. And I, I seriously think everyone was wishing that he hadn't spoken because the speech was so badly prepared. But I stand by the fact that it was his responsibility to speak in that situation. <laughs> and I wish he had done a better job. <laughs> One more question. One more. Yeah, in the back. Examples of introverted leaders. So if you look at Susan Cain's book, Quiet, she has some outstanding examples featured. She has some hot in her blog, too. Um, I think it's often hard to find, honestly, because one, there's, it's a really small fraction. And two, they're not usually in the spotlight. Um, so there's a little bit of, of a challenge there. But I think that another place you would find them is um, when Jim Collins writes about level five leaders and good to great, he's often talking about that kind of quiet humility that's more characteristic of introverts than extroverts. Um, it's hard for me to feel comfortable saying so-and-so is an introvert without really getting a comprehensive assessment of their personality. Um, I will say, though, that there are a lot of great and classic historical examples. If you think of Gandhi, Rosa Parks, Lincoln, uh, many of the people that we've really looked at as very charismatic figures were much more shy and quiet and withdrawn. I think we have some contemporary examples out there. Um, Doug Conan at Campbell's Soup is one person who has come out and said, basically, I'm leaving the introvert closet. Um, and I actually am one, uh, and has been pretty vocal about that, which is interesting. Um, but I think we're still waiting for role models to be more front and center. And I would welcome that if people have ideas. Thank you again for having me. If anyone wants to chat further, let me know.